Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, I thank you very much for your kind invitation, and uh, see you on twentieth of uh, September. Thank okay. You. All, all so right. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, let me introduce. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor hmm? Pulsesh. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Professor yeah, Pulsesh yeah, obtained yeah. his BSc from 1900 uh, BSc uh, and MSc degree from George University Gwalior, and he received Eight his second. BSc in uh, 1979 from University of Delhi under the supervision of R P Saxena. He worked as a postdoctoral researcher at University of. Castle Plowton, E2 to E4. He then held a five year position of UGC research scientist performed by University Grant Commission of India at the uh, University of Delhi, 86 to 92, followed by a five year position at University of Delhi, University, 90 to 94, before being appointed as a professor at Delhi University, 1994. Uh, his, uh, his research focuses on the formal aspects of quantum field theory, string theory, supersymmetry, and the supergravity and the super string theory. In particular, he studies the canonical structure constraint the dynamics of the constant front quantization of field theory and the G brain actions using the Hamiltonian and the path integral formulas as well as the RL So I welcome uh, Professor Bruce uh, and uh, over to you. <coughs> and dear Parton, please uh, mute your uh, microphone, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pant. Uh, am I audible to everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. and uh, am I visible to everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, that's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let me first extend my thanks to Professor Sanjay Pant, uh, a great friend of mine. Namaskar, very... sir. Namaskar. <laughs> namaskar, namaskar, sir. <laughs> we, are, we are really privileged to have you with us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank, you thank you so much for sparing your time. I, I, I'm equally happy to be with everybody, all, all great brains right. today. I'm very happy joining everybody. The the so so joining the stream of the best brains of our country. Great, and the upcoming younger generation uh, that looks forward very hard to us to 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 aspire for the for uh, doing something in academics and in physics. So with that, uh, let me let me begin with the topic of the day. Uh, 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 let me first uh, uh, make it clear that uh, I have nothing to share except myself and my views and my thoughts. So so no slides, and uh, uh, usually in the classrooms we work with the chalk and talk method and uh, in the talks people also like to use slides and I'm going to use the method of talk without chalks so no chalks no slides except my own views and I hope to 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 communicate to you some of my views some of my thoughts I would take you to a short journey through my stray thoughts on which always uh, remain in my mind, uh, which happens to be one of my main hobbies. Uh, so uh, I, I would try to think and, and discuss with all of you uh, my, my stray thoughts on uh, the concepts in classical and quantum theory. So uh, uh, before I talk anything of the theory, I first like to quote an example. Uh, very often, I, when I find in the books, so people talk about the inadequacies of classical physics or classical mechanics. And some younger people who are just trying to introduce themselves with the subject, sometimes they infer that maybe there is uh, the classical mechanics or classical theory or classical field theory is not that great or super, but perhaps everything that has to do with quantum is uh, 
super and great so i want to uh, remove those misgivings and uh, i want to emphasize that classical theories are as important and in fact they are very rich and very often they are the mother theories so uh, let me first take the example of a tra trip to the moon so way back in july 1969 the uh, americans uh, astronauts they landed on moon what i want to say about this in the context of my talk today is uh, with a small question and answer also from my side when we begin our journey from earth to the moon what are we aiming at conceptually apart from that the the entire technical support uh, and deep space navigation expertise and everything but conceptually what are we aiming at are we aiming at the moon where the moon is present at that time of departing from earth certainly not if we do that then by the time we arrive at the point where the moon is now then the moon would have moved away from that point by the time we arrive there you see so everything is in motion so we aim at a vacant point in space time and we aim at a vacant point in space time then how do we make it so we have to plan our things such that okay i mean usual techniques you take off and uh, i mean uh, you you are in a in an elliptical orbit around earth and you keep increasing the uh, the the size of your orbit all the way as long as the earth's gravitational field extends you can easily easily extend the trajectory or the elliptical orbit of your of your spacecraft and you have to keep in mind where the gravitational field of moon begins and so we can certainly think of the elliptical orbits around the moon our aim is to somehow join one of those elliptical orbits around i mean to to join some motion around the moon let me say which we can so and when we are uh, we must arrive at that vacant point which we had originally planned in our brains that the moon arrives there little bit before we arrive there so that it's there to welcome us to capture us to receive us otherwise we would be lost into the space there would be no gravitational field to catch our spacecraft so when we leave the gravitational field of earth there must be a gravitational field of some other object which can catch us so we enter slightly with the slight deviation of the trajectory of our spacecraft we with, with minimal you see we plan it like that so we leave the orbit of the earth and we leave and we enter the orbit of the moon so the main point of my citing this example is we aim at a vacant point in space time and we make all these calculations there is hardly any quantum mechanics here it's all classical mechanics and classical theory and classical calculation you see that and similar is the case when you are already in an uh, around the moon in the in the gravitational field of the moon now you start maneuvering it in a different manner of course you need all technical support but conceptually so this my particular first example is primarily intended for the very very beginners and the very very young minds uh, who enter the game of physics that they must not forget that classical theories are very rich and very important and very very essential for us so with that uh, i mean uh, not that we simply hear that oh classical mechanics has some deficiency where we need to define the domain so quantum mechanics is valid in the atomic and subatomic scales at the atomic and subatomic nuclear and subnuclear scales quantum mechanics is relevant you see but uh, at that time 
I would not even expect my classical mechanics or classical theories to work. You see, but of course, you see the, the idea, so uh, I would not undermine any theory over the other, but we go side by side, okay? So that is the my, my idea of conveying to you, but we must always keep in the back of our mind that the, the classical theories are usually the mother theories, and we have to develop from there and uh, develop the quantum theories. Quantum theories, the construction of quantum theories would of course I mean, there are quantization procedures. Quantization means construction of quantum theories. Okay, so I again come back to the classical theory, the beginning of classical mechanics. And here I again wish to emphasize a few very, very basic points. And I, I am telling it from my experience uh, with my students, with my teachers, with my senior. I mean, my students are now senior, senior enough. They are even professors at many places. So you see, that when you learn mechanics at the first year level, you think about what is momentum? Oh, mass into velocity, very simple. So people, by that time, they have again forgotten many more things and they say yeah, mass into velocity, yes. But that is called as the kinetic momentum and it may or may not be the correct definition, you see. So supposing I have a room, I have applied electric and magnetic fields uh, along my walls. Uh, if no, no electric field does not matter, but at least a magnetic field and I make a, an electrically charged particle pass through that room. So everybody knows about the Lorentz force, uh, Q times the capital E plus Q by C into V cross B. So this second term, which is V cross B, is the velocity, the cross product of velocity and the magnetic induction. This is very important. From Lorentz force, you can calculate the uh, potential energy of, for this system of this electrically charged particle moving in this electric and magnetic field. If you look at the standard textbook on classical mechanics by uh, Herbert Goldstein, in the first few pages you find this example. So the, the potential energy in such a case would be a velocity dependent potential. So potential energy like the force, you notice that V cross B term was there in the Lorentz force. So potential energy would also be velocity dependent. You, so, I mean, you talk, you, you know about conservative and non-conservative systems. So for such systems where potential energy depends on the velocity, any of the velocities of the system, then these are non-conservative systems and you have to go back to the definition of the generalized force. So uh, the best thing to do to, to, to get control of all these things is to start with the basic framework of classical mechanics where I first construct a Lagrangian or the action. So if you sum the Lagrangian over all times or you integrate it over all times, you obtain the so-called action. So you can talk about action or about Lagrangian, does not matter. And this Lagrangian is the difference of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. You see, for conservative systems where potential does not depend on velocities, uh, the Hamiltonian would come out to be equal to T plus V. In, if you look at some any standard textbook on quantum mechanics, look at one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, my most favorite example. And so they might start directly with the Hamiltonian, okay? So which is, uh, if, you, if you translate it in terms of kinetic and potential energy, it comes out to be the sum of the two. And then by the time people are involved in this and they have forgotten about the basics of classical mechanics, they start in thinking, oh, so Hamiltonian is just the sum of the kinetic and potential energy. No, that's wrong, incorrect. That's not correct. So the correct way to construct Hamiltonian we must never forget is through the so-called Legendre transformation. Start with Hamilton, start with Lagrangian, that is the seed. That contains the entire information of a dynamical system for a classical theory, whether it's mechanics or it's field theory, I would take you also to field theory in a few minutes. Uh, so then you generate all the canonical momenta. These canonical momenta are partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to velocities. Now these canonical momenta may or may not be equal to kinetic momenta. For all conservative systems, it would be equal to the kinetic momentum, but for all non-conservative systems, the canonical momentum would not be 
the would be different than the kinetic one. So this is one point. Also from here we remember that this pair of Q, I, P, I, they are called canonical pair of variables. Now, uh, side by side we look at quantum mechanical, quantum concepts. So you talk about Heisenberg uncertainty principle and usually people talk about, okay, delta X into delta P, X delta Y into delta X, delta Z into delta P, Z, delta E into delta T. Now supposing my theory has more than, um, it has six Qs and six Ps. Now what about uh, beyond X, Y and Z? So the correct answer to this is that these uh, uncertainty relations or principles or this, they hold true for any pair of canonical variables. And this canonical pair of variables is defined or constructed by obtaining the canonical momentum which is the partial derivative of Lagrangian with the same canonical velocity, qi dot, pi del L over del qi dot. This is one point we must always remember. When people make mistakes on these small, small things, that really makes me worried. So whenever I have an opportunity, I like to highlight that this is very crucial. And so canonical pair of variable. Okay, then it's simple. You can write down equations of motion, vary the x and variational principle, obtain the equations of motion. So in the Lagrangian formulation, you obtain Euler Lagrange equations. If you like, you can go to Hamiltonian formulation if it's needed, depends upon the physical problem. So Euler Lagrange equations are second order equations, but so for going to Hamiltonian formulation, first construct the Hamiltonian correct way. I have seen many researchers internationally, not only Indian, but Western and uh, sometimes Indian people are more careful on these little, little points. I'm sorry, but I'm not making any bad remarks for anybody. But it really makes me mad when I think that people is ad hoc, in an ad hoc manner, they start with some Hamiltonian. They must see if this has been calculated correctly or not. Because your entire investigation is going to be based on that Hamiltonian. All your numerical techniques and advanced techniques you apply to that Hamiltonian. But you must make sure if it's correct or not. So. Uh, uh, using canonical, this legendary transformation, canonical momenta, you construct the correct Hamiltonian. Then, of course, you again use variational principle, obtain Hamilton's equations, and then, okay, you can solve them. They are now first order equations. So this is one simple point. Before going on to quantum mechanics, I wanted to highlight the importance of classical mechanics and classical. And, and mind you, when I extend my systems, when I generalize, my mechanics, you see, all mechanics, also I like to make it clear. These are some basic fundamentals uh, because I have this platform to communicate my views. So classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, classical statistical mechanics, classical uh, quantum statistical mechanics, in all mechanics, Qs and Ps, whether 3 or 10, does not matter. So they are functions of time, time and only time. That is mechanics. Now, when I like to generalize my concept from mechanics to field theory, what I do, I replace qi of t with some, let us say, phi of x mu, and pi of t just by some, let us say, pi of x mu. So this x mu is important, symbol is not important. So that the fields are functions not only of time t, but are functions of x, y, z, and t, or all the phase space variables, or the all the uh, all the coordinates of the theory. Okay. So phi's are coordinates, pi's are the momenta. Again, all the techniques that I just uh, recapped for classical mechanics like canonical momenta, Legendre transformation, Hamilton's equations, Euler again. All of them also hold true for the field theory. So one thing in field theory is that my Q of T, P of T, they go to some fields which are functions of X mu. We have learned it also in first year, second year, third year, that this electrical intensity and the magnetic induction, they are functions of X, Y, Z, and T. Okay, at that time we didn't realize why it was like that because they were fields. Uh, similarly, now I also gradually take you to some little more advanced uh, concepts. They are very simple concepts. So when we talk about x plus y whole square to a first year or a ninth, tenth student, a very easily one would write x square plus y square plus 2xy. Uh, why not xy plus yx? Because 
somewhere in our mind, we, without being told, we know that they are bosonic variables. So x by is the same as by x because they are commuting variable. They commute. If x by were non-commuting, then uh, then this would be different. I will have to bother about the ordering of x by and by x. You see, so we are gradually taught more and more advanced concepts as we progress in our life. That is the point. That's very good. So now. Uh, we go a little bit further. Uh, in, while going to from mechanics to fields, one more thing I would like to highlight is my very famous example of uh, one dimensional stretched string. And in the classroom, I tell my students, look, in the first row, you are sitting 10 of you. If I ask you to accommodate more students in the first row, what do you do? So they will have to squeeze themselves up. And so, if I consider a, some stretched string of a particular length, and I say, OK, I try to decrease the uh, inter-particle distance, uh, going into dx, going to 0, vanishingly small, then this system, then my string of that fixed length would be equal, able to accommodate infinite number of particles, you see, in the same length when the inter-separation distance between two of them goes to zero. So, and that would be the uh, best example to introduce uh, to learn field theory. If you look at Advanced Quantum Mechanics by J.J. Sakurai, on the very first page or second page, you find this example. Where, so then what happens? I had X and I had Lagrangian. Now I would also have Lagrangian density. If I sum my entire Lagrangian density over the entire space, I construct Lagrangian. So when you go to field theory, you also talk about densities. So Lagrangian density, Hamiltonian density, everything is now in density. And you, if you sum over the entire space, you construct the full quantity. So for example, energy momentum tensor density. But if I integrate it over dqf, which means I, I sum over the entire space, I get the full quantity. So this we need to know. We need to recap in our mind. So these are some basic points. Many people want to know what is the basic difference in classical quantum mechanics and classical field theory and quantum field theory. This is the first basic difference. So in field theory, we are dealing with systems with infinitely uh, large, uh, many degrees of freedom. That is the, that is the main point. So uh, well, uh, after this, let me take you to some further. Uh, uh, let me introduce a little bit further. So uh, one more thing, as we know, uh, as we learned from the example of going to the moon, we already inherently thought, yeah, so classical mechanics is deterministic. So if I have some in my classroom, I, I saw a piece of chalk by throwing a piece of chalk. So uh, that means the motion of a projectile. It follows a particular trajectory that you can determine to be a parabola. So if you are given, if you know the initial conditions, then you can determine it, the motion, at each and every subsequent most point of motion of this, of this particle. So classical mechanics is deterministic. Now let me just consider uh, a, a simple example what happens to quantum mechanics in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is probabilistic. So uh, my classroom famous example is I'm in my lecture room and I have started walking from my home. And I tell them that, look, if I uh, classically, I can follow one and only one path for reaching the lecture room after starting from my home. But quantum mechanically, I can follow infinite number of possible paths. I can go from this side, from this side, from this side infinitely large number of possible paths I can follow for making it to my lecture room from after starting from my home. So uh, what you do in quantum mechanics, you take the sum of all these, all these various paths that you follow. And, and gradually, actually, there is nothing really advanced. There is nothing difficult. Everything consists of little, little simple things, simple ideas. So uh, let me go step by step. So, in, I mean, and there are many, many things because I would eventually take you to the top level of these ideas in this field. Uh, Professor Panth has been kind enough to give me sufficient time. So I should, I hope to cover a few uh, important concepts. Of course, you, 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 you invent. So in, in first thing that I was mentioning was 
which is important is principle of superposition of states. In classical mechanics, I said Lagrangian contains entire information about the system, entire dynamics of the system is encoded in Lagrangian. What happens in quantum mechanics? It is the state vector. I construct a state vector and this state vector contains the entire information about my quantum mechanical system, whether it is quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, irrespective of that. So, and from the state vector, I can construct a wave function in the configuration space or a wave function in the momentum space. I just take the inner product of a, of a, uh, of a eigenbra, position eigenbra with a state vector. I have the uh, wave function in the configuration space. If I take the inner product of the momentum eigenbra with the state vector, I construct a wave function in the momentum space. Of course, I can relate the two through the Fourier, well-known Fourier. Transformation one can one can go back and forth from one to the other. So, but these are some very simple techniques of, of quantum mechanics. They also apply to, to quantum field theory. Now, you see, as we said at the beginning, that the applicability domain of quantum mechanics is atomic and subatomic scale. So, there the velocities become also larger and relativity automatically comes into the picture. You cannot ignore relativity. And in any case, it's a very nice concept. It gives you the mass energy equivalence relation. So, for learning and for, so we would love to marry uh, special relativity with quantum mechanics. And that is what then you obtain is the relativistically invariant uh, gauge field theory of quantum, quantum field theory. So, so that for that we need to, we need to know uh, the covariant notation, you see. As you know, the law, every law of physics has to be covariant so that it's invariant and Lorentz transformation. I would like to highlight for my very, very younger friends that this uh, Hendrik Lorentz and Henry Poincare, these two guys who wrote down the Lorentz transformation and Poincare transformation, they talk to us about, they tell us about the space-time symmetries of a system of a theory. So uh, I would like them to recap these things once again in the mind and try to put these Lorentz, Lorentz transformation equations that we learn at first year or at some level into the covariant form, into the uh, covariant notation. So x mu goes to x prime mu equal to some matrix a mu nu times the four vector x nu. And from here, take an ex exercise, try to write down all those four equations that you learned in, at first year for special relativity and try to put them back in the covariant notation. This is one good example uh, for people who electrodynamics is also the most successful theory uh, of uh, uh, classical electrodynamics, you know, by J.D. Jackson. Classical electrodynamics, classical. Out of the four well-known interactions, two of them are uh, the gravitational interaction and the electromagnetic interactions. And both of them, the classical field theories for both of them are extremely most successful and extremely well tested experimentally to several digits actually. So classical uh, field theories are important and now gradually we would go to construct how to construct the quantum field theories for these theories. But in the first place, one more exercise I would like to tell about electromagnetic interactions uh, is to my, to my younger friends, try to use the variational principle, try to write down Maxwell's equations in the covariant form, d mu, j, d mu, d mu f mu nu equal to j nu, for example. So this contains two of the Maxwell's equations. Try to obtain those two equations from this and try to put that those two equations back in the covariant form, okay? The other two can be done similarly. So these are some very, very small exercises that my friends could take as tutorial exercises or something just to recap the, the basic ideas of physics. Okay, now I uh, would like to highlight a few more points. You see, I, I'm not following any particular uh, ordering of my thoughts. So uh, I would briefly recap very, very quickly that uh, if you consider a uh, two-slit experiment for the single photon beam, you produce a single photon beam of single photons, uh, and pass it through the splitter, make two beams, pass them through a double slit, and you collect the spectrum on the other side. What you obtain is uh, 
the interference pattern which you obtain so uh, my idea is not to really tell you that photons could be considered as waves my idea here is to tell you that if i denote these two as uh, by some physical state psi1 and psi2 then the resultant psi or psi3 would be c1 psi1 plus c2 psi2 so principle of superposition is important let me cite one more example the photon polarization experiment which is very famous so you consider uh, a wave uh, traveling along the z direction and polarized along x direction and you also consider the beam traveling along z direction but polarized along y direction and so these are two different physical systems in my quantum mechanical language and then consider the third example that Uh, uh, the uh, the the resultant or, or the third wave is polarized in a direction in an arbitrary direction lying in the x y plane then i can take i denote one by psi 1 one by psi 2 then the resultant psi 3 would be c1 psi 1 plus c2 psi so these c1 c2 uh, are complex numbers and here so in general uh, you can take and the psi star would be c1 star psi1 star c2 star psi2 so the product of the of the of the row matrix c1 star c2 star c3 and the column vector c1 c2 c3 would be c1 star plus c1 star c1 plus c2 star c2 etc and this would add up to 1 because the total probability has to be 1 so these are the probabilistic interpretation and statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics these two aspects are very crucial and very important that i wanted to highlight with that i go on to think of the modern quantum mechanics which really starts from the year 1920 exactly 100 years ago so 1920 21 when the stern and gerlach these two very famous guys they performed an experiment in frankfurt so they they made the the silver atoms were made to pass through in homogeneous magnetic fields and the spectrum was collected on the other side you know that the magnetic moment of the electron is proportional to the vector l the orbital angular momentum which has 2l plus 1 eigen values where l is is little l is integer so it takes values 0 1 2 3 up to l and also in the minus range minus 1 minus 2 minus so 2l plus 1 so for little l equal to 0 i should get only one line but in this experiment of stern gerlach uh, you obtain two lines and what is the explanation for that why should you obtain two lines prior to that people did not know about the spin angular momentum so these two bright brilliant guys ulenbeck and god smith they they thought i mean everybody thinks but sometimes we are lucky to find the answer so they found out uh, that could it be some intrinsic angular momentum that this electron has got because silver atom has 47 electrons so it's essentially one electron system okay and then it turns out that okay so uh, so the if we assume the spin angular momentum then this uh, anomaly this magnetic moment is going to be proportional to the vector s which could have the the components s1 s2 s3 or sx x s by s z and this indeed turned out to be true that it was because so and this spin quantum number could have fractional values also 0 1/2 1 3 1/2 2 etc this was a landmark result you see stern gerlach experiment coupled with the interpretation by ulenbeck and god smith it gave rise to the birth of so called mod, modern quantum mechanics prior to that we were aware of quantum theory for 20 25 years and now this is the modern quantum so poly gave it the name spin you see poly spin matrix but dirac independently arrived one of my idols is paul moles dirac and one of my idols is david hilbert the the famous german mathematician who said that you ought to be able to explain your complicated things and views and calculations everything to the first man whom you meet on the street is a very famous quote from david hill but which i have taken to my heart i remember all the time so i tried to explain my whatever i know i should be able to explain it to the why not to the to my younger friends yes so this is one thing and well paul morris dirac is always at the 
you find at the root of everything so he said oh so he then after the the idea of spin was established uh, by these guys and poly gave it the name spin poly spin matrix and everything uh, uh, dirac also independently arrived at the same idea and not only that then he went ahead and he constructed the spinners corresponding to the spin one half particles spin one half fields you see that is what we call as spinner fields and you call it dirac theory dirac spinners uh, and, and so on and so he was able to explain the massive spin one half particles like electrons and positrons you see now hermann weil another physicist another brilliant guy he thought why could this not be possible to do it for massless spin one half particles and then he wrote down the two by equations and you so they of course now even if the neutrino has a tiny mass does not matter we have so called bile neutrinos which are supposed to be massless and so that describes so bile spinners and bile equations they describe this spin one half uh, massless particles with all these things in in place in in about uh, 10 years time anderson discovered either uh, dirac wrote down the dirac equation anderson discovered positron and Hermann Weyl wrote down the Weyl equation. You see, so it's great, great physics that took place in the ten, ten to twelve years, from nineteen twenties to, uh, I think, positron was discovered in nineteen thirty-two. I wish I, I, I had lived during those times to watch these brilliant guys uh, working on this, on this brilliant idea. Anyway, we are lucky to have their. findings with us today and we we have to understand them so with that i think let me move little bit further and this is uh, i think uh, uh, yes now so as i said that relativity comes also in between and we have the covariant notice. but but before i go to that i i am i am fast running out of time uh, but i wanted to mention that there was a guy proka uh, in 1936 he wrote down proka action where he talked about the massive photons and people thought this guy was crazy and such brilliant guys they usually have to suffer unfortunately harman bail also suffered proka was also not taken seriously now what you find in your lhc experiment this w plus w minus and g0 particles uh, they are analog of the photons but massive they have masses they all each one of them got a nobel prize 83 83 82 gev and so on you see so anyway so this is one thing now so let me let me introduce relativity also into my work so supposing i have the expression for the kinetic energy uh, e equal to p square by 2m this is non relativistic and i substitute the usual uh, quantum mechanical operators to this equation i would obtain schrodinger equation but supposing i take the relativistic definition of the kinetic energy so uh, p square is small p square which is p mu p mu in relativity this is e square by c square minus vector p square if i use the metric tensor plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 so this is very good i'll just take a sip of water now so uh yes so i was talking about introducing the relativistic concepts so you take the non relativistic expression for kinetic energy and you apply on both sides i mean first replace these uh, dynamical variables by operators and then apply some wave function on both the sides and then you do the same with the relativistic expression for the kinetic energy but now you will end up with the so called klein gordon equation this is also a relativistic equation then uh, i would here it is important to emphasize that look by the time these things came into existence klein gordon maxwell equations already existed in the literature uh, one century ago so now they are 150 years old so now you see you can obtain them uh, from field theory but how and what is the what is the difference why should you do it so that means i have to make a transition from non relativistic quantum mechanics to relativistic quantum mechanics in the first place that i am trying to do 
So from, from going from Schrodinger equation to Klein-Gordon equation, if I use relativistic kinetic, kinetic energy. So that is a counterpart of the Schrodinger uh, equation in relativistic quantum mechanics. Then Dirac equation is already a relativistic equation. Maxwell's equations are also relativistic equation. Now we know they can be put in the, in the relativistic covariant notation. So then what is the, what was wrong with the relativistic quantum mechanics? Was there something wrong? Actually, the things needed to have a new interpretation. In what we have in relativistic quantum mechanics, all these equations like Klein-Gordon equations, uh, Maxwell's equations, and the Dirac equation, the, these quantities, these objects like phi or psi or a mu, they are supposed to be to describe single particle relativistic equations which are obtained from relativistic quantum mechanics. But now we construct some action of the Lagrangian or the Lagrangian density for a system in field theory. We use the variational principle and we obtain the Euler Lagrange equations of motion. And they could be Klein Gordon equation if my field theory involves a scalar field or complex scalar field. If my theory involves a spinner field, then I end up with Dirac equation. If my theory involves vector field, so L is minus 1 by 4 F mu nu F mu nu. If I vary this X and obtain the Euler Lagrange, they are nothing but Maxwell's equations. So now, in field theory, Maxwell's equations are the same. Dirac equation is also the same, but the concept of psi being interpreted as a wave function has to be changed to a field. That is the point. And in, in Schrodinger theory, we had rho equal to psi star psi or phi star phi that was interpreted as the probability density, which was always positive definite. In Klein-Gordon theory, if you write, it would be some constant times phi dot phi star minus phi star dot phi. So this could be negative, this could be positive, this could be zero. And the, we have to abandon the pro probability density interpretation of the relativistic quantum mechanic. And we have to introduce the concept of four vectors so rho is then the time-like component of the four current J mu. So this is a charge density, okay? And then again continuity equation. So being all my friends, my, my, my younger friends, uh, I would urge upon them to always look for the correct interpretation of the things uh, that we need, we want to communicate to the further younger generation or the students. Uh, we must not communicate the wrong concept to the people. Uh, so we should take it little seriously and we should clarify our own concepts and com communicate with the students the correct ideas and thought. So uh, one very famous example, there is a very classic book by um, uh, Bjorken and Drell. Everybody knows uh, old book, two volumes. First volume is called Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. Second volume is called Relativistic Quantum Fields. So you see, whatever is written in the first volume, it's supposed to be the Bible of Dirac theory. But it was written at that time as a relativist, uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. All those things hold true in field theory, but with the correct interpretations of not wave functions, but the fields, quantum fields. OK, so that takes me through this. Now let me, um, I, I understand I have another 15 plus 3, 18 minutes. So uh, let me start summarizing some of these findings. And you see all the things that you learn, as I said, four interactions, so strong and weak interactions, and uh, two uh, long range forces, electromagnetic force and gravitational force. You see, so classical theories exist only for gravitational field and, and uh, electromagnetic field. But there is no classical analog of strong interactions and weak interactions. As I said, or I have forgotten to make this remark, uh, time is always short for me. So uh, that the concept of spin also did not have any classical analog. There was no classical analog of spin angular momentum. You see, it is found eventually that this also satisfy this same algebra of Poisson bracket. Uh, before I proceed to the further uh, standard model summarizing my things, uh, I would like to, to highlight to, but I, it seems I have uh, forgotten. 
what I wanted to say, the, uh, anyway, when it comes back to my mind, I have no, 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 uh, I do have some very, very rough uh, chaotic uh, pages with me, but I'm not following them. Anyway, so, uh, uh, you see, uh, so classical analog does not always exist for some quantum concept. This we need to remember. And here, I wish to draw the attention of my old friends and younger friends in particular to two landmark uh, concepts of quantum mechanics. One is the correspondence between the Poisson brackets and the commutation or anti-commutation relations. So you see, I consider it a very fundamental thing and I spent a good amount of time and energy to derive it. Anybody who is interested is welcome to look at my my video lectures on there is a youtube channel uh, with my name daya sankar kulsreshta i have lots of lectures on quantum mechanics in one of the lectures i have precisely obtained the correspondence from poisson bracket to the commutation relations so the same dynamical variables they uh, you can write down the poisson brackets following mr dirac uh, so, so, work through the, the classical dynamics. And if you go to the so-called Heisenberg representation, you see you have three representations, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and Dirac representation. In Schrodinger, in Heisenberg representation, time dependence is carried by the operators. In, in Schrodinger representation, it is carried by the state vectors. So you write down the Heisenberg equation of motion. So please try to obtain that Heisenberg equation of motion for some dynamical variable. And you will find, you will be able to really derive the, the correspondence of the classical Poisson brackets with the quantum mechanical object called commutation relations. Uh, this is something which, which fascinated me most. And the, another landmark uh, concept for constructing quantum theories is also given by Mr. Dirac, but Feynman worked on it extensively, called as the path integral approach to, to quantum mechanics, to quantum field theories. Here, we talk about, you want to go from point X to point Y, or point one, point A to point B. Uh, classically, you can follow only one path, but quantum mechanically, you can follow infinite number of paths. So you sum over all those paths, possible paths, and you find out the transition amplitude. So let me uh, let me tell you what is the transition. So uh, in the in the quantum mechanics, when you talk about quantum dynamics, you come across an operator called time evolution operator. So which is the time translations generate the time evolution operator, just like the space translations generate uh, linear momentum, <coughs> and the, the rotations generate angular momentum. Similarly. Hamiltonian or energy here. So uh, the time evolution operator evolves its dynamical system from some initial time to final time. And what I am simply summing up is you obtain the matrix element of this time evolution operator between the initial and the final state and just take its absolute mod square and that is the transition probability. And this transition probability Mr. Dirac told us that this corresponds to the integral of the exponential of the classical action of the theory. This is a wonderful thing. So this also we need to really understand. And that tells you, so uh, action is a purely classical object and transition amplitude is a purely quantum mechanical a, a, a object. And the two are related through this Dirac conjecture, which was then Feynman worked on it extensively to develop the entire Feynman diagram approach in field theory. If we have some uh, opportunity uh, in future course of time, I would love to give uh, more talks on this. But now, before uh, I end up, I have 12 minutes left in my watch. So I can, I would like to summarize that all these findings that I have talked about the, uh, uh, the, the classical field theory and quantum field theory. First think of classical field theory construct the corresponding quantum field theory by quantizing it. Uh, that Mr. Dirac has given us already these two well-known procedures. Through this, you construct the, but there is one more, another important example, uh, if I could, could briefly mention, is the 
वन डायमेंशनल हार्मोनिक ऑसिलेटर इन क्लासिकल मैकेनिक्स एंड इट्स एनालॉग इन फील्ड थियोरी सो यू हैव स्केलर फील्ड वेक्टर फील्ड एंड स्पिनर फील्ड यू ऑलवेज हैव दिस सो कॉल्ड एनिलेशन एंड क्रिएशन ऑपरेटर्स एंड दिस आई मस्ट नॉट फॉरगेट सो इफ आई डिनोट बाय सम नंबर डेंसिटी ऑपरेटर व्हिच इज द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ ए डैगर ए ऑपरेटिंग ऑन सम ऑन सम स्टेट एनर्जी एनर्जी आइगन कैट एन i get the eigen value times the same energy i can get and if you operate on it by a dagger then the eigen value increases by one quantum unit of energy as cross omega if you operate on it by uh, one annihilation operator you uh, the eigen value decreases by one unit of quantum unit now supposing i have an interacting field theory having scalar field vector field and spinner field then i would have three different pairs of uh, annihilation and creation operators and if i choose to operate with the creation operators of these three fields scalar vector and spinner on the vacuum state then i would be able to construct uh, three particle state where one unit of quantum energy be for the scalar field one for the vector field and one for the spinner field and this is one uh, this is one beautiful uh, idea and uh, similarly i mean you could so in 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 path integral approach one talks about uh, vacuum to vacuum transition what is this vacuum to vacuum transition one vacuum is defined at the time t equal to minus infinity and one is defined at the time t equal to plus infinity okay so you calculate the transition amplitude from vacuum to vacuum means from time equal to minus infinity to time t equal to plus infinity and this is what you can obtain uh, for any theory but before i before i tell that let me uh, not forget uh, i would try to come back to this for 2 minutes if possible Uh, that all these ideas of these four interactions they could be summarized beautifully in the so called standard model of particle physics where you have the contents of the theory six quarks six leptons and vector gauge bosons one photon eight gluons and w plus minus and g zero uh, however if you want to go beyond this i will take up this further tomorrow then you introduce supersymmetry into your theory supersymmetry Uh, rotates bosons into fermions and fermions into bosons and then you construct supersymmetric standard model where the number of particle contents gets doubled because you have uh, a super partner corresponding to each and every particle and that is supersymmetric standard model uh, but uh, what happens that this supersymmetric standard the standard model is a gauge theory having local gauge symmetry but supersymmetric standard model has rigid supersymmetry it's not uh against theory so i would like to construct a gauge theory in the process i will have to introduce gravity into my theory so i would introduce a, a gauge quantum field which is the gravitino field spin 3 half field and uh, this spin 3 half field is uh, is a, uh, called gravitino and uh, then the theory again becomes a gauge theory and it acquires local symmetry so this is known by the name super gravity theory now depending upon how many super symmetries i have in my theories 1 2 or 8 so in 1 n equal to 1 super gravity i have 1 graviton and 1 gravitino in n equal to 2 i have 1 graviton 2 gravitino and 1 photon so this is the dream theory of mr einstein which n equal to 2 super gravity theory unifies electromagnetism with gravity but uh, for the moment my ideal theory would be n equal to 8 super gravity theory which would have one uh, graviton with a spin plus 2 one graviton with a spin minus 2 8 gravitinos with a spin plus 3 half 8 with a spin minus 3 half 28 uh, vector particles with a spin 1 28 with a spin minus 1 56 uh, electron like particles uh, with spin plus 1 half and 56 with spin minus 1 half and 70 scalars analogous to the higgs boson of the standard model the god particle so that would be the full particle content of this n equal to 8 8 super gravity theory and in my 
it seems to me that this could be the ideal theory of quantum gravity which unifies all the four fundamental interactions of nature and if one could succeed the younger generation has the challenge if one could succeed in succeed in experimentally verifying the graviton or the gravity you know when if you verify graviton if you observe a graviton directly or indirectly uh, some of my friends at groningen are doing table top experiment to to discover this graviton you see you have to think of smarter ways to do things uh, uh, but if you can find gravitino in the lab that would verify your supersymmetry it will verify super gravity it will verify quantum gravity because super gravity is the theory of quantum gravity of zero dimensional particles and fields super string theory is the theory of quantum gravity of extended one dimensional extended objects called string open or close bosonic strings super strings if and when we have time i i invite my friends to to watch my video lectures on string theory and super string theory from my from my youtube channel just write my name in the google and you hit upon my youtube channel look for more than 350 video lectures are there you can find the relevant ones but my my aim here is to highlight that all these developments from classical theories to quantum theories from mechanics to field theories you see eventually then going from standard model which is already so it is one of the most accurate theory of nature just like gravity theory they have been verified up to several digits up to several digits okay Uh, just very simple qvd calculation uh, gives you the uh, anomalous magnetic moment of the electron using 72 feynman diagram it has been experimentally verified up to eight digits uh, i'm not even talking about uh, lhc findings i'm just mentioning old things but so, so this is one of the most successful theories but just look beyond so you construct supersymmetric standard model then Uh, look at the it's not uh, gauge theory so construct the corresponding gauge theory on the way you construct a super gravity theory where you have introduced some super gauge field uh, which is a spin 3 half field so it's a vector spinner field a new you see uh, graviton is a, is a tensor field and uh, uh, vector particles are vector field in any case and spinner fields electron positron they are described as spinner field of mr dirac but this is spinner vector or vector spinner these are spin 3 half fields they are gravitinos if the younger generation could look for some smart experimentation to look for and verify if one has some success then you see the bhata what is the total i i was just for the sake of fun i counted uh, the number of these uh, all these particle contents of super uh, gravity n equal to 8 super gravity theory so 1 plus 1 two gravitons you can add them up 8 plus 8 16 gravitinos 28 plus so these what are these numbers 1 8 28 uh, because n equal to 8 super gravity so 8 c 0 just co combination permutation combination 8 c 0 8 c 1 8 c 2 8 c 3 8 c 8 8 c 8 and 8 c 0 are the same okay 8 c 1 is the same as 8 c 7 and so on okay so you can add up these all these figures to find out this is the content of this theory and you whole ocean of knowledge is lying behind before you to be explored construct the particle physics of the entire super gravity theory think of all the possible feynman diagram think of all the possible masses and couplings of this so many particles maybe it comes out to be i, I don't know it's uh, uh, 1 plus 8 plus 28 plus uh, 56 plus 70 so up to 56 add them up multiply by 2 plus add 70 that gives you the total number of particles and each one has a different coupling you see scalars are like higgs boson you had one higgs boson that made the bird crazy god particle now you have 70 of these god particles in my n equal to 8 super gravity theory uh, my batch still tells me i have another 2 minutes so uh, well this is one very very important thing and uh, if you permit me i would like to uh, go back to that uh, comment my comment on path integral formulation one very uh, one one of my very favorite uh, um, i am almost through with my my physics but i i wish to to provoke my my younger people with a shloka from bhagavad gita and then i will tell you the meaning of this shloka 
सो द श्लोका इज फ्रॉम द नाइन्थ चैप्टर ऑफ भगवदगीता श्लोका नंबर सेवन ऑफ नाइन्थ चैप्टर ऑफ भगवदगीता इट से Uh, I'm sorry. I again forget. Yes, it says, "Sarv bhutani konte ya prakritim mami anti prakritim yanti mami ka." Sarv bhutani konte ya prakritim yanti mami ka mami ka. Kalpak chaye punastani kalpa dau bistra jamya. Me har kalp ke prarambh me. लिविंग बींग्स की रचना करता हूँ और हर कल्प के अंत में वो सब लिविंग बींग्स फिर मुझे प्राप्त करते हैं सो दिस इज यू कैन गो टू द वन डायमेंशनल हारमोनिक ऑसिलेटर बिगिन विद द वैक्यूम स्टेट विथ विथ जीरो नंबर ऑफ पार्टिकल्स ऑफ ऑल काइंड्स विथ ऑल जीरो मोमेंटा यू ऑपरेट ऑन इट विथ क्रिएशन ऑपरेटर्स ऑफ वन काइंड एंड अदर काइंड थ्री काइंड रिपीटेडली यू कंस्ट्रक्ट एन पार्टिकल स्टेट टू पार्टिकल थ्री पार्टिकल फोर पार्टिकल स्टेट्स इफ यू टेक इट्स मिरर इमेज इज गोइंग टू बी आई गन रा सो वैक्यूम ऑन दिस साइड एंड एन इलेसन ऑपरेटर्स ऑफ ऑल दिस काइंड एंड यस इट्स गोइंग टू बी फिफ्टीन सो जस्ट ए फ्यू सेकेंड्स मोर एंड सो दैट मीन्स दिस इज ए काइंड ऑफ ए वैक्यूम टू वैक्यूम ट्रांजिशन यू कंस्ट्रक्ट इन पाथ इंटीग्रल फॉर्मेलिज्म so transition amplitude from vacuum to vacuum transition so you sandwich your time evolution operator between the initial state and the final state and that gives you the transition amplitude takes the modulus absolute uh, square of the absolute value of this transition matrix element and uh, then you can think of some so in qvd simplest qvd theory simplest field theory uh, uh, you have a vacuum diagram where you have electron positron and a creation of electron positron pair with the emission of a photon and you also have the annihilation pair annihilation with the absorption of a photon so you start with a vacuum you end up with a vacuum and that is called as a vacuum diagram that is simplest theory but in n equal to 8 supergravity theory you have almost 200 or more than 200 particle contents and you can think of all possible ideas so i would like to leave you with these thoughts of mine uh, and and one should i i tend to think that uh, that this uh, little book it contains lot of science actually we need to investigate it just like even understanding path integral is difficult just like understanding quantum mechanics is difficult or quantum field theory is difficult or string theory is difficult. and so is the case with this uh, without understanding it one should not simply throw it in the dustbin it's a very valuable book anyway thanks a lot for having your patience with me and and i hope you will forgive me for the the, the things that you do not like and uh, and remember the good things that you may have liked thank you all very very much all the best lots of love to everybody thank you very much so uh, it seems that uh, professor sanjay pant is uh, not there anybody who would like to take over you see i ha i have finished more or less in time maybe i overshot you have some questions it looks like to me in the chat box Uh, if you like you could read sir, me sir can i ask you a question yes as many as you like and as long as the chair yeah, yeah. person uh, yeah sir uh, i am dr nandan patil from kaji nazrul university assam so west bengal mm -hmm. sir my area of uh, research interest is theoretical quantum matter physics mm -hmm. see actually in quantum matter physics we always use uh, hamiltonian description mm -hmm. but in particular physics we use uh, mostly lagrangian description and action and etc yes and never have anything like hamiltonian in uh, field theory so is there any specific reason why oh. in uh, field theory no, uh, no, no. we use uh, lagrangian description not hamiltonian oh that's a very very good question actually it's a fundamental question and let me answer this to everybody you see what happens i just told you the very very simple things like starting with the lagrangian you construct the uh, i would in the first place recommend you to look at uh, the, the inspire have papers of mine and uh, look at their citations that i have cited there because uh, this is one of my main fields of working the quantization of uh, field theories so i begin with classical field theories and i construct quantum field theories and on the way i construct hamiltonians and 
not only canonical Hamiltonian but also so-called to total Hamiltonian. In fact, let me draw your attention to uh, to one very very famous of Mr. Paul Morris Dirac, my my idol. Uh, this is about, uh, it, it was published around 1949 or 50, 1949, something like that. It is published in Canadian Journal of uh, Mathematics, probably. It's one of the brilliant papers of, of theoretical physics of, of the last 150 years or last 100 years. I would say, but not too many people give uh, attention to it. So what happens, I begin with the Lagrangian, the correct way to do any field theory is also what we do in classical mechanics or classical field theory. Start with Lagrangian or Lagrangian density, construct canonical momentas, then construct ca canonical Hamiltonian, then again use variational principle to yoke to, to, to find Hamilton's equations. Uh, one of my collaborators in the Iowa State University, James Wary, uh, our collaboration started way back many years ago. And it was this point he noticed that he says that you uh, are more interested in mathematical descriptions and you leave your theories, you find out Hamiltonians, and we start working from there. So we can have good collaboration. So uh, I mean working from starting with Lagrangians, finding out Hamilton. So what happens when, just let me take classical mechanics example. If, when I find canonical momenta, if my momenta right hand side does not contain a velocity, what I said was valid for all those systems where the momenta pi involves at least one of the velocity. If it is not there, which, is, which happens in the electrodynamics case. So when you write down pi zero, the right hand side does not have any velocity. So pi zero equal to zero is therefore a prime Dirac primary constraint in the theory. And then you would like that this constraint be preserved in the course of time for all time to come. So you have to ask for its uh, commutation relation with the Hamiltonian to be zero. Then only it can be preserved for all times to come. Uh, it has to be a constant of motion. In the process, you discover further constraints, which are called secondary constraints. So you add all primary constraints with the help of Lagrange multiplier fields, which are dynamical, to the canonical Hamiltonian. So obtain Hamilton's equations from the total Hamiltonian. They are the correct equations of motion that describe everything for you, you see. And so just, just starting with some Hamiltonian really does not make any sense to me. It makes me mad because you're, very often the Hamiltonians are wrong by, by done by great, great guys who are very famous. They just look at them very carefully. So what they do, they similarly, they make three mistakes. Very often, the very well-known people make these mistakes. Uh, the, the very Hamiltonian that they use for a theory is may or may not be correct. So you have to check it with the, the basic principles that I'm telling you right now. Uh, and then you obtain all the uh, Poisson brackets, the, the uh, generalized Poisson brackets are called as Dirac brackets, which apply to all cases, including constrained dynamical system. So electrodynamics is a constraint. Most of the physical theories of fundamental physical theories of nature are constrained systems, which are defined in terms of overdetermined set of coordinates, less, just like the electromagnetic theory. You have only two physical components, A1 and A2, but you introduce A0 and A3, A3 just to achieve covariance in the theory, you see. So A0, the time-like component, and the longitudinal component, A3, they are superfluous, but they are needed for a covariant description of the theory. So this is the best known example. And similarly, you find that the same logic works with every theory. And for that, you need to follow Mr. Dirac procedure of constraint dynamics, obtain primary constraints, obtain secondary constraints, obtain the correct Hamiltonian of the theory, obtain the correct uh, total Hamiltonian of the theory. In fact, then one, one, one further you can find is the reduced Hamiltonian. When you implement all your constraints, there is a concept of weak equality. When you implement them strongly, they are strong only on the hypersurface of the constraints, not otherwise. 
so if my pi zero is zero as i say in electrodynamics it may not be zero zero everywhere in my phase space only on the reduced hyper surface of the constant and when i similarly the other mistake that people make is through the fixing of gauge fixing conditions choice of gauge fixing conditions the gauge fixing conditions are to be chosen such that they convert the set of first class constants into a set of second class constants you see then that is the correct choice otherwise this you cannot arbitrarily arbitrarily pick up anything you like no that is incorrect but people without knowing these methods they just and, and they say i am working with this particular gauge and but, but bhai who who told you to do this you have to justify that this is the correct way to do it and then so hamiltonians have to be correct gauge fixing conditions have to be correct and finally the commutation relations equal time commutation or anti commutation relation people simply avoid and say now we impose on our theory who authorized you to impose these things on your theory why you cannot impose anything on your theory by and then this theory is a, i don't recognize this theory so correct thing is to find it out through following the procedures laid down by the great physicist legendary paul morris dirac we need to follow him please look at his work you can side by i am a small guy i do very few things and i am more of a teacher than a researcher i have infinite number of doable ideas in my mind but i cannot do them myself you see so i provoke the younger people to do it to look at things i throw open my ideas in front of my younger generations younger friends and uh, uh, you have given this opportunity with this fundamental question so i thought you see i could not make it a part of such things as a part of my i had many many more things to tell you but time was limited to 75 minutes so i try to do my best in that but if you have other questions i can keep answering as long as the chairperson allows me to do that Sir, I have just one small minor comment. Uh, uh, did did, did my answer help you? Sir, you mentioned about this Bjorken-Wells uh, 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 group uh, 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 on relativistic quantum. My dear quantum. friend, I think your name you said Patil or something. Did I did I answer your question? Yes, 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 sir. You have answered your the question very beautifully. I have okay. just one small comment to make. Yes. Sir, you mentioned the Bjorken-Wells group on relativistic quantum mechanics and relativistic quantum field theory. Yes. I have used. both of them in yes. uh, when i was a student as well as i'm teaching now great. then you must be genius you must be genius yes but sir, one can't uh, use them the, so easily another book which i find is very illuminating for dirac equation is this bethe and jackie's book oh, yes, intermediate sure. quantum sure. mechanics sure sure i sure. find it very illuminating so i don't know how, exact number how many books i have on quantum mechanics and quantum field theory and uh, i mean this theoretical physics with me but now i have started collecting pdf versions because i cannot store them anywhere you see so but i mean uh, of course lois rider mandel they are classic books and and one of my great friends from rochester ashok das he writes very fundamental beautiful books look at his lecture notes on quantum field theory look at his, he, he has five six seven books very beautiful books in fact one of his books on lectures on gravitation for long time i have been carrying it with me to read like a novel everywhere i told him and he was laughing <laughs> he is a nice simple person he comes here very often to india and um, i am a great fan of him even though he is 2 years younger to me i you see many of the younger people they are so absolutely bright you see i i, I just respect such 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 people you see so so yeah i mean, did did we did we cover your second question enough yeah yeah sir yes, yes so so i mean look at this and and nowadays you are even more lucky you can look for pdf files in my days i had to go to the to the my library and central library and kathpa library and and say bhaiya iski zara photocopy kar do is page ki kar do and then i used to collect lot of this photo then i got them bound, bounded you see in the form of book uh, below my below my laptop Uh, these 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 bounded books are lying there <laughs> because you ca- you couldn't buy or collect all those those books so i used to collect them and then get them bounded into this shape but then i realized that it's it's impossible to to <laughs> i mean store them and cataloging them then you can't find thing but i mean uh, pdf files are now good enough we are lucky so so you can but always i mean uh, you have if you have done bjorken it so you, you must have found that whatever is written in his first volume uh, although he he has given the title fields 
relativistic quantum fields but uh, quantum mechanics but that is actually all applies to to field theory it's the same thing same algebra same Dirac algebra same thing the wave function is to be interpreted as a field that is all and you can obtain it from the action so everything is there in that book that is a that is a uh, holy book and uh, if one can understand Bjork and Drell then I mean that's that's there is nothing beyond that sir I I have a small question sir mm -hmm. Sir, can I can I proceed, sir? Yes, sure, please. Sir, uh, actually, we could get ample amount of information from your lecture. Thank you for that first. Oh, and then okay. I have a small doubt uh, mm -hmm. in the approximation method. That is the Born approximation method. Mm -hmm. Since the energy potential energy is very small, mm -hmm. the scattering could not uh, be very much effective as uh, like an incident an incident wave. Mm -hmm. So in that case. What, uh, how is it practically possible to find out the cross-section as well as the amplitude of the scattered waves? Oh, uh, I cannot immediately when the, think of When the incident view. energy, the level of incident energy is like, so uh, higher than the scattered energy, mm -hmm. then what is the possible bond approximation still could be used to, to find, I mean, theoretically prove that, the, theoretically we can find out what is the scattering cross-section as well as the amplitude, mm -hmm. but still practically what is the possibility to find it out, sir? So, so, so do you, you consider this, I, I'm, I'm not able to recollect uh, exactly, but as the name suggests, it's born approximation or something, so approximation is, but could you think it in terms of more fundamental, could you define the process a little bit, what you are thinking of? Uh, no, when the potential is, scat is no, scattering low. Of, no, in, in the yes. first place, you, you try to tell me the objects that are being scattered. Yes, 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 yes. What are those objects that are being scatter scattered? Particles when it is scattered, particles. Particles that are scattered, mm -hmm. when the incident particles have some uh, possible amplitude, mm -hmm. but after scattering, I mean, when the potential is very low. So whenever I read this, I get this, uh, I get uh, stuck with this point. So, so that's why I feel like asking this. Uh, the the so. one thing that I can tell you is the, that, that takes us again back to the basics. Like yes. uh, if I talk about for example, atom-atom scattering or molecular scattering or atomic scattering or nuclear scattering, you see, you go down and down, then maybe you yes. go to the, I'm just, let me put up my thoughts, then maybe I can talk about the neutron-proton scattering, for example. So you still get gather information, but then uh, you will think that maybe I have changed the subject altogether. But then uh, the basic constituents of the, so whatever two objects that I am going to scatter, if it were possible, I would first go to their basic constituents, like the, if I think in terms of quarks, like neutrons and protons, or any uh, two mesons or uh, baryons, who consist of, which are consisted of two or three quarks, for example. So if I formulate my things in terms of the, eventually in terms of the scattering of the most fundamental particles being involved, like quarks, or anti quarks or uh, instead of talking about the because even neutron and protons are also particle particle scattering if i scatter neutron or proton or two mesons or two baryons you see which again are not fundamental by themselves but consist of two or three quarks so yes. if the objects that you are considering born approximately i think this is being used in quantum mechanics i remember but is it in the non relativistic domain then these could be you see, when you go down and down from molecule to atom to nucleus to subnuclear to neutron, proton, and quark, you the energies keep increasing, increasing, increasing. Of course, you at the cost of uh, I mean, what is more fundamental to you? But if you go up stairs, the energies become less and less. For example, most of uh, molecular and most of atomic physics you can describe in terms of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. You perhaps would not need their even Klein-Gordon equation. So it depends if I could resolve my, my two objects that are being scattered to a more fundamental level of constituents, that, that, uh, that might help me. So if you try to redefine in your mind what is the given problem to you, 
what are the objects that you are scattering are they for, for me i am just to put put them in some words are they molecules are they atoms are they hadrons neutrons protons atoms they... say for example in atoms atoms when it is getting scattered hmm. the amplitude is very less when it is compared with the incident uh, ah, I uh, see. way i see so in in the first place uh, now i know your problem little bit better in that case yes. in the first place i would not even think of any relativistic mechanics i would just yes. think of non relativistic mechanics non relativistic quantum mechanics and, and i have i have the same equal respect for that you see it just the question of these energies and validity domains and so on so that is also very great respectable physics and in that uh, so if you go to less energies you say now you define your question once again Yeah, so, incident so now, energy. So now I am thinking in terms of atom, atom is scattering. Okay. When the potential that is used to mm. uh, do this process, like uh, yeah, when yes, it is yeah, uh, ejected yeah. with mm. a low energy mm. and hits the target, and when it is getting scattered, mm. so the amplitude or the cross section of the scattering wave will be very much lesser than the incident wave. I, oh, oh yes, 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 yes. That looks yes. Logical. So in that case, what is the possibility that we can find out? the uh, cross section practically but uh, theoretically yes it is possible using the von approximation method we can find mm -hmm. it out mm -hmm. but still uh, practically i am stuck in that place that's why so is there any other clarification or uh, I, i would i would uh, yes i would take it on my uh, my limitations in this area of my knowledge so <laughs> uh i mean sir, can not... i comment something Excuse yes me, sir. please yes, please please yes. please uh, sir there are small angle scattering there are different small angle scattering methods and using small angle scattering we can find out the cross section for that ma'am is saying for low um low intensity uh, scattering we can find out using uh, small angle scattering it's a scattering That's a crazy incident. Small angle scattering, small angle scattering. There are different methods. That is, you are talking about theoretically. Theoretically, it is possible, no, right? No, theoretically, this is experimentally. Experimentally, or experimental. This is experimental field. Uh, also, it's uh, available in indoor. Also, it is starting in indoor. And except indoor, outside India, there are different countries uh, where there are synchrotron facility, and in synchrotron you can. Uh, even small angle scattering and using small angle scattering, a uh, thin film characterizations are done. And like you are saying, different uh, different sectors, different uh, fields of uh, yes, research. Yes, I could follow. I could follow. Yes, 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 I could follow. You can check. There are different types of scattering. Yeah, I could know very well, like hundred percent sure that we can find it out. Also, you can prove. Yes, yes, yes. You can just prove it. Can I tell you? Theoretically, also you can correlate that. Yes, yes, yes. I want to actually. Okay, thank you, ma'am. I'm actually in the field. Okay, okay, okay. I can follow that. Yes. Something I know. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. If you people allow me, in between, I take just one minute. to yes, sir, to, yes, to tell all or all, all my dear participant friends that uh, because from the announcement you have uh, you have known my full name it's daya shankar kulshrestha so i i just like to tell you that uh, my email address is daya shankar dot kulshrestha at gmail dot com so continue all small letters running daya shankar dot kulshrestha only one dot in between at gmail so um, all of you are welcome to be in touch with me through my through my email and and i would love to do that okay so please feel free to yes so thank uh, you sir thank you sir oh okay okay welcome you know but it, the the questions have been very th thought provoking and very useful questions because this these these questions and answers they help everybody you see because somebody is is working in some domain somebody is working on some other domain but but one suggestion i might still uh, give repeatedly or once again if i have done that earlier that uh, one thing we is very important that irrespective of in which particular area or field we work do our research work 
you, you cannot work on everything, you see. I also know limited things and I cannot work on everything. But we should keep loving the fundamental ideas of physics, which are actually, if a person who is, I mean, I, I'm telling you from my, my, many of my friends whom I know, if, if a person with PhD and with in physics and all those titles, and if that person just tells me that, yes, oh yeah, yeah, is this mass into velocity is momentum, then, then that really worries me. I mean, this because anywhere, everywhere, you see, the, the earlier great experimentalists, they were, they used to be very, very good in theory. I'm not, I do not mean that now they are not. But I mean, uh, in particular in Germany, where I have spent several years as a student, as a postdoc, as a teacher, at different places, as visitor, and that uh, they seem to take theoretical things also very seriously. Theory people are usually zero in the <laughs> experiment. <laughs> I am so sorry. Um, although I, I try to admire their, their working because that is the real, real brilliant job and challenging and demanding job. Uh, theory anybody could do, I mean, uh, but experimentation is very, very difficult, very, very difficult. But uh, even in theory of various kinds, uh, we, we must keep loving the, the fundamentals of physics and mathematics and try to, try to marry them wherever possible, you see. The ma all, every mathematical thing would be beautiful if we know the correct interpretation concept related to that object. And similarly, each concept would be beautiful if we could associate it with the correct mathematical description, you see. So wherever, at all platforms, at all levels, we need to, to improve and strengthen the mathematical background of the students for sure why whatever they do at the end it does not matter but to develop the brains we need to tell them mm, the, i mean experiments also need to be taken seriously these days at the school level i mean sorry uh, it's not being taken so seriously and people they start when they come to first year level even in the best of delhi university colleges uh, when first year student they seem to be unaware of something in the lab which they really should know after all they, if they have come out of after 12th but because then they tell you the truth you are uh, a very kind friend with them they tell you sir we have done in school partly propagation of errors from various corners <laughs> so we need to strengthen and re-strengthen it and we must need to to, to highlight them to, you see, we, they are our future. We need to educate them. For me, most of you are younger to me and are the treasure of the mankind, treasure of the country, treasure of the world. So it's my duty to, I do not hesitate in telling you little, little things 10 times. I say, I assume you are my student and let me tell you this. But, but I don't want you to do these mistakes again. So or I don't want you to leave you unaware of those things, you see. So uh, that is what, uh, and it is, if, if someone, it is possible that my video recording has come out to be okay, in that case I will upload it on my YouTube channel. So you can look back at it again and again and find out my mistakes. Tell me on my email that this is not correct. This I need to improve. Even though it may be correct, but I need to improve. One should always improve, improve, improve. And lastly, hmm? I'm very happy to have met all of you. I understand it's more than 66 or how many? Too many? There, there, are, there are many, many. 70 participants. Yeah, so 70 participants. So I'm fortunate that if I were sitting there offline, then I would have really loved to interact, have a cup of tea or coffee with all of you, have sometimes my lunch or something with you and share some more conversations. But there are advantages that we are at least able to talk, you see. In the online mode, as one speaker said, that you see online mode has given this facility that now uh, almost you can sit at your home and just in your own study room and, and, and talk to 70 people. It's very good, great. They may be spread anywhere in the, in the, across the world, right? 
and you if you are lucky you have its recording you put it back on somewhere on your some platform where people can again hit up on it and look at it right so that's that's very lucky but what we miss is this that i cannot have a cup of tea or coffee with you i cannot have conversation with you i would have loved to have conversation in person with you which i love very much i, I do that with my students all the time they i am always surrounded by students and i love to talk to them i am never afraid of if someone tells me my mistakes and shortcoming i mean unless you tell me my shortcoming how do i improve you see so so we need to be open minded for our shortcomings but uh, uh, but uh, one thing i would say this is outside of physics because you see when you do this uh, this theory i i work in also gravity theory tomorrow's talk would be on gravity theory from classical to quantum gravity and uh, you have many of my lectures on string theory and super string theory uh, not too many on gravity theory it, it depends on the chance you see what you are teaching at that point of time do you have some facility where somebody could record it for you you see uh, initially we all used to hesitate and we never collected these things you see but if we had this then then they help other people because they can look at your things and oh yes because they want to have knowledge you see so uh, sometimes listening and telling uh, is becomes easier or at least a part of it you see so side by side they can look at books as well as look, look at look and share these ideas with you so uh, we must appreciate these online modes that uh, many of us may not have made it physically to nanital uh, which we have made it through this you see so so that is one advantage Uh, and uh, it it's very very uh, useful actually so mm, well if you like uh, it seems that after my talk was there some gap of coffee gap or something because it is it seems uh, it, it, it was early actually after huh? first lecture there was a coffee break but that uh, question answer says smooth extended so we couldn't had uh, oh, that uh, coffee break that's great so all of us are lucky to have got this additional bonus part but you people know it, it's online for every one of us for each of us so you obviously also cannot go for a cup of tea or coffee <laughs> we of course we have the option to leave the meeting and then have it <laughs> okay 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 but if you like in my things that i may have i wanted to highlight little more on this annihilation and creation operators you see and construction of n particle see that's a very good thing that you can do in quantum mechanics you can also uh, i also wanted to prove that when you talk about annihilation creation operators and when you apply it to one dimensional harmon of harmonic oscillator without saying it's bosonic harmonic oscillator you see so then these a and a dagger they are commuting x and p they are commuting and then the eigen value of this number density operator turns out to be little n and uh, you can prove it mathematically that this little n is greater than or equal to 0 so it has it is an integer it has value 0 1 2 3 all the way up to n and there is no upper limit on this n and if you make a small deviation in this calculation if you assume that your annihilation and creation operators obey anti commutation relations which means they are fermionic then you find beautiful thing now again construct the uh, uh, number density operator which is a dagger a and find out its eigen eigen values then you will find that number density operator n square minus little n equal to 0 so n into n minus 1 equal to 0 so this number density operator has only two eigen values when the system is fermionic and therefore if you construct two particle state and interchange the position of one particle with the other you find that this state vector picks up a minus sign so anti commutativity of fermionic variables follows you see uh, in your results and if you make these two particles identical lay the same so let us say a two particle state with one r one r or one k one k so both the particles are identical you find that this is uh, this is because the a square is zero and a dagger square is zero for fermionic variables so what you find that this turns out to be zero which means poly exclusion principle simply follows 
without any efforts that your number density operator has only two eigen values this which allows for the non commutativity and if the particles are made to be identically the same then you get zero which means you cannot put two identical particles in the same quantum state whereas i could put infinite number of particles if they were bosonic i could put any number of particles in the same quantum state this is what so what you do in quantum mechanics one dimensional harmonic oscillator or let me now say bosonic you can also consider fermionic oscillator but if you write if you consider simple uh, scalar field theory then all this work works there all algebra is the same but a and a dagger are now functions of the three momentum k you see a dagger function of k a function of k the number density operator becomes function of k whereas it was not function of these things in my quantum mechanics then i can have this uh, this annihilation creation operator for vector fields for spinner fields you see so uh, and uh, you apply it to the vacuum state and you construct so when you read some or listen to some great guys or read some very po popular articles or things on um, quantum theory or string theory or whatever you often come across a sentence which even in my talks you might have heard or you if you discover my video lectures that <coughs> uh, in 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 special relativity you have the mass uh, equivalence of mass and energy in quantum mechanics you have the possibility of creating uh, creating uh, energy out of vacuum which is which is Uh, not empty but is a boiling soup of particles being created and destroyed so this is a philosophical statement but it has this meaning which is encoded in my description of harmonic oscillator one dimensional is good enough to understand the bosonic harmonic also fermionic are the same applies to field theory the same technique applies to the string theory if you look at my lectures on string theory or super string theory you will find that i i do take almost a full lecture on first recapping all this technology for one dimensional harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics extended to scalar field then extended to string theory so, so step by step you can go from you from go from classical mechanics from non relativistic to relativistic from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics from quantum mechanics to field theory from quantum non relativistic mechanics to relativistic then to fields relativistic quantum field theory you can go to to supersymmetric field theory you can go to supergravity theory and if you go want to go further you see in all these theories the interaction vertices are zero dimensional if you consider the feynman diagrams of let us say electron electron scattering or photon photon scattering or whatever then these interaction vertices are zero dimensional and there is a question of singularity at r equal to 0 in the coulomb law of force as well as in the newton's law of force of gravity so in the coulomb law of force which is for electrostatics you take help of this uh, uh, heisenberg approach heisenberg uh, uncertainty relations and this singularity at r equal to 0 for the first three interactions strong weak and electromagnetic the singularity at r equal to 0 can be smeared out through the uncertainty heisenberg uncertainty principle if you want to construct a similar quantum theory which i said quantum gravity beyond quantum beyond beyond super gravity theory because in, even in super gravity theory the interaction vertices are zero dimensional you see so they might still give rise to if although in super gravity theory uh, the divergences they get cancelled at the s matrix level so one does not need to renormalize the things you see as one has to do with the conventional quantum field theory of the other three interactions you see so one modifies the if one wants to modify the uncertainty principle so delta x h uh, h cross by delta p plus some constant alpha prime which is uh, regi 
slope, trajectory of the Rajai slope. So times delta P by H cross. Then this automatically does two things for us. Now delta X in the earlier version without this modification of uncertainty principle, delta X could go all the way up to zero and delta P could go all the way up to infinity. But with the modified uncertainty principle, delta X can no longer go to all the way to zero and delta P could no longer go all the way up to infinity, which were the main causes of the divergences in the conventional field theory or quantum field theory. So, but you pay the price that your interacting object had to be made one dimensional. So that delta X, that uh, alpha prime, square root of alpha prime, that sets the length scale in string theory, which is 10 to the power minus 33 centimeter Planckian scales. So if you want to, uh, if you don't want to take any risk whatsoever, means you don't want to consider zero dimensional vertices at all, then you have to modify your uncertainty principle, then accordingly we have to introduce one dimensional objects into your theory and they are uh, either open strings with two ends open or with closed strings with loops. So that is then it takes you to a string theory, you see. But one can achieve and one automatically one it is higher dimension, dimensional theory. So one has to bring it back for experimental conf confrontation with the experiment, you have to reduce or uh, make some meaningful reductions of the string theory. So supergravity theory can be obtained as a low energy or some suitable uh, compactifications of the string compactifications to obtain, uh, obtain the supergravity theory. You see, until for the last three years, I have not done classroom teaching for these the regions of COVID. So my video lectures on superstring theory, they, they, they do not talk much about uh, supergravity theory. Uh, I, I, I had to give these two sets of uh, full semester courses in Germany on supersymmetry theory and supersymmetric field theories and supergravity theories. But uh, because of this uh, COVID situation, I couldn't do it. And otherwise, one would have got another one or two sets of my video lectures for these topics. So I, I give these short talks on wherever people lovingly invite me. So I am grateful to all of you for, uh, for having your very, very kind patience with me. And uh, I, I think you have this workshop going on for, there are very, very serious speakers, very, very, I could hear Professor Duvedi the last few minutes because my mind was occupied, so I uh, could not listen to his entire talk. But I understand that very valuable talks are going to be there, have been there and are going to be there, so you are lucky and fortunate to be there. Uh, and I'm also lucky to have all of you as with me in the audience and I found that your interest and enthusiasm for listening to me has been tremendous which has, which has motivated me and derived me to be able to talk to you. Um, I, I hope and believe that we will have other platforms to talk to us, among us, yes. in future also. Tomorrow I have this uh, topic on classical to quantum gravity, okay? So I hope... Okay, hold. Yes, yes, please, please, please continue. It's at the no, same... No, I, I was just saying that... Yes. No, no, I was just saying that you said that tomorrow we have a uh, lecture on the, the classical to quantum gravity. Uh, yes. So that's what I'm saying that, yes, yes. So uh, should we take a couple of questions, short questions? Right now? Then we'll conclude. Sure. No, yes. sure, sure. Whenever you like. We have the time. We must make use of time. They they have they have not logged us out. They have not uh, ended. The host has not ended the meeting. So the platform... Uh, I, I, I'm a day monitor. So I have to... I'm hosting and I have to conclude it. Okay, okay. Oh, that's great. That's great. Fine. So you want to... You, 
want us to stop it yes sir oh great 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 uh, yes so tomorrow we can continue uh, tomorrow we can continue from this point itself so uh, we can take a couple of short questions and i think vijay uh, uh, already raised his hand mm -hmm. so vijay please short question mm -hmm. uh if by mistake he has you have done please uh... sir i have i have some little, little doubt about that mm -hmm. okay, sir, okay sir in uh, in sir lecture i discuss a an equation that is the 8c0 is equal to 8c8 similarly 8c1 is equal to 8c7 so what's about 8c4 8c4 Oh, you are talking yes, about the n equal to eight super gravity counting of the particles. Yes, yeah, yeah, oh, yes, oh. yes. So, yes, so, yes. so, so eight C zero, eight C zero is the same as eight C eight, which is one. Yes, sir. Then you keep reducing yes, it yes. by one. So eight C one should be eight, and eight C seven should also be eight. That that is the number of gravity nodes. Yes. So, so, yes, yes. so eight C. Uh, uh, let, let 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 me recap it. 8c0 gives me the number of gravitons with helicity plus 2 8c8 gives me the number of gravitons with helicity minus 2 8c1 gives me the number of gravity nodes with helicity plus 3 half and 8c7 gives me the number of gravity nodes with helicity minus 3 half now 8c2 8c2 might be 28 So twenty-eight photon-like vector particles is been one particles with helicity plus one, and eight C six might be the same twenty-eight from back side. We have to yes, the same. So 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 yes. that would again be the uh, vector-like photon-like particles, but with but with helicity minus one. Okay, and uh, uh, there okay. is a proper way to define the helicity. You see. helicity and spin yes. they are analogous but but not identical they the same so uh, 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 if you have give me one, uh, at the end one or two minutes i will define that uh, and then 8c how far have you gone 8c 0 1 2 3 8c 3 should be how much 8c 3 8c 3 so 8c 3 might be 56 Uh, yes. Factorial eight divided by factorial three times factorial eight minus three in the denominator. Okay. Yes. So so that okay. might be fifty six. So that is the number of uh, spin one half electron like fermions with helicity plus one half. Yes. And then eight. Uh, you come from the other side. Eight C. How much? Eight C four. Eight C. Eight C four. Let me go again. Eight C zero. Eight C one. Eight C two. Eight C three. Eight C four. Eight C four might be seventy. Yes. Eight C four. Seven. Hmm. Uh, factorial eight divided by factorial four, and factorial four twice in the yes, de sir, denominator. Seventy. Huh? Seventy. Seventy. So that is the number of Higgs-like scalar. particles your okay. your famous god particle now you have 70 of them and uh, so uh, after uh, that would be so 8c3 and 8c5 might be 56 56 each that is the so uh, you see helicity you keep reducing in the in the theory of uh, super gravity theory and super symmetry theory i can prove that if i operate if i have n equal to 8 supersymmetry i have eight supercharges and i annihilate my uh, graviton state with spin 2 by i apply one operator bunce it reduces my uh, helicity by one half then i apply it again it reduces the helicity by another one half it you see so uh, this is how i calculate the number of so i have n equal to eight supersymmetry okay that is the that is okay. the logic okay. that is the logic so th the number of supercharges is identically equal to the number of uh, supersymmetries present in the theory and supersymmetry how do you count that 
you, in your ordinary field theory, you write some gauge transformations and some gauge through some gauge parameters. So in supersymmetric field theories, these gauge, gauge parameters are Grassmann spinners. They are Grassmann variables and spinners. Grassmann spinners. So in supersymmetric uh, field theory or supersymmetric standard model, these uh, uh, transformation, these uh, these gauge parameters are fermionic but constant, constant Grassmann spinners. And in supergravity theory, which has a local symmetry, all these trans these gauge parameters of course are fermionic, of course are spinners, but they are functions of X mu, they are fields by themselves. You, you got my point, that in supergravity theory, in supergravity theory, the gauge parameters are local again, just the way they were in my standard model. In the intermediate state, uh, the theory which was supersymmetric standard model, the transformation gauge parameters were not uh, depending on x mu, but they were constants. Okay, they were constants, okay. and, and therefore I called it a, a theory with rigid supersymmetry. Rigid means it's the supersymmetry when the Grassmann parameters, the gauge parameters, they are constants, constant spinners. Then that is what is called as the rigid supersymmetry. And when you make them local, then you are forced to introduce gravity into the theory. Because now uh, covariant derivative is not enough. When I constru construct my QED theory, then I have electron, positron, photon. So I, in, a, in the Dirac spinner theory, I, intro I replace my del mu by covariant derivative and I introduce a gauge field A mu. That is my QED theory. Now in supergravity theory, I have to use super covariant derivative. And here, gauge field A mu is not enough. I have to introduce a, a gauge field. So the gauge field of supergravity theory are spin three half particles, and they are per, they are they are they are not bosons anymore. They are fermions. In all other three theories, they were bosonic, but now they are fermionic. You see, this is the main difference. Now they are fermions. Uh, so the gauge field. So gravitino is a is, is not a boson. Gravitino is a is a spinner. It's, it's a fermion, but it's been three half, not it's been one half. So this is different than the electron, positron. It is, it is, gravitino is therefore different. And you cannot describe it just by Dirac spinner. You see, that is, that describes it's been one half particles. So gravitino is a spinner vector, means four vector and spinner, or spinner vector or vector spinner, the way you like to call it. You see, so both variables would vary, take values like a spinner and vector, you see, depending upon the dimensionality in your, uh, in your given problem. So, so these are some very basic, basic concepts. You see, when, if, if you prepare yourself, like I, I try to prepare myself for classroom teaching, using yes. talk and chalk method in Germany, as you will find in my, my video lectures. For that, you have to really prepare very, very thoroughly because the people who are sitting in front of you are very bright, smart people. You see, some of the questions that you people are asking me are, are, are very intelligent questions. You, you, can't, you cannot simply ask these questions unless you... So, you, they, they, so I mean, and it reminds me that, yes, we are an intelligent uh, set of people sitting on earth. It's, we are grateful to God. It took 13.7 billion years, the nature to create us. And we must make full use of it, you see. Life is rare, precious, and it's an intelligent life which God has created. It took 13.7 years, you see, to, to, to evolve to this level that we can talk about this. So graviton is a tensor, but uh, so this is, gravitino is a vector spinner. Then one is spin down, that would be spin one, they would be again vector particle, then spin one half, spinners like like the rack spinners so okay so to develop okay, thank you sir so so this opens up a whole box infinite dimensional box of doing things you see uh, uh, people used to say that now what happens in the next semester next next century maybe the guys will have nothing to do but i tell you the other way around just the opposite now you have infinitely large number of things to do 
our younger generation would have infinitely less. And you, you see, you will have to develop smart experimental techniques, including computer science, including experimentation, high energy physics, detectors of all these levels. And, and uh, uh, we may not be there in another 100 years, who knows? You see, as I recounted that modern quantum mechanics was developed in 10 to 12 years, you see? So you, you never know. I'm saying 100 years might be too much. The, the younger generations are getting more and more brighter and intelligent and smarter. So you always have some people who would do things, take, take the things further, right? And I, I, I'm an optimistic person, one of the most optimistic persons on earth. I think most positive person on earth. I, I believe that things can be done, would be done. Younger generation would do it. Yes? And, and science is by a religion by itself. This is what we need to remember. We cutting across region, religion, place, country, nationality. No, these things don't matter. Basudhaiva Kutumbakam. Entire earth is our family. And we need to develop our things accordingly, you see. And people are doing it. People are doing it. There are always people who are able to do these things, you see, take these things seriously. Otherwise, we would not have developed so far. See, look, just look at our advancement of the last 100 years. How much it is in, in beyond imagination. I mean, in, in all, all subjects. When we talk in terms of the spacecraft, you, you need to develop deep space navigation technology. Sitting on Earth, you can turn around your spacecraft, whether it should face towards the moon or uh, opposite to the moon, or if it goes all the way to Mars, how should it happen if the, it will not be on that side? We can maneuver our, our things to, so that it will wait for the few seconds until we want. Then again, it have connection with us. See, these, these are, I mean, in all fields, I, I admire everybody. So science and technology, physics, and all other subjects, theory, experiments, everything goes hand, hand in hand. And we need to exchange for this region, we need to exchange this. So in a way, this is very useful kind of a program where, you see, without younger people also, you cannot really, I mean, then you would tend to think, oh, these guys are all uh, great physicists, then what do you talk to them? So you, you assume, yes, there are some younger guys, there are some people who would like to know and learn. Then you speak out your mind and never hesitate in telling your mind to the younger people, never hesitate in sharing your thing. Knowledge in, increases by distribution. People learn by listening, talking, discussions, you see. We must encourage it, we must. So the, the show must go on. Hmm? So our host told me that the host would like to close the session. Okay. Am I right? I think we should uh, close the session now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So, so, so I uh, see you tomorrow. So, so thank I thank you, sir. Uh, I thank you very, very much. Very, very much. Thank you very, very much. All, all the best, Lord. So, tomorrow again. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much sir, to all the participants as well. And, okay. Uh, to okay. To okay. okay. Great. Now, great. Uh, great. I look forward to being with you again. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. 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 Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. You so much, sir. It's, it's so nice to listen to audience. your voice. Thank Had you, sir. Offline, I would have talked so much. I'm very happy listening to your voice. <laughs> all the best, all the best, all the best. So, Thank you, sir. Okay, okay. Lots of best Thank wishes. Thank you, sir. Lots Thank you. Best Thank you, Lord, sir. Thanks a lot. Lots of best wishes. Lots of best wishes. Lots of best wishes. So I have met you personally in Nepal. Uh, I have joined one of the sessions in Nepal as well, sir. Oh, oh, and what's your so name, I'm please? In the, I am uh, speaking from Nepal, sir. Nandal. Oh, and oh, uh, I have joined Vishal, your session. Vishal Kumar Sharma. Doctor Vishal Kumar Sharma, sir. Okay. And, uh, Yes, sir. Yeah, this COVID restricted me to come back to Nepal. Yes, I, I would that, come, uh, I would come back whenever there is uh, an opportunity. I will come back. Yes, yes you, you have you. a loving faculty, yes. loving students. They are all very good students. They listen, try to be there. I mean, they take things very, very seriously. I am very impressed with the students there and with the faculty there. All, all faculty is very interactive, very friendly, uh, very courteous. So, 
we look forward to being there with you yes sir we again yes 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 yes, 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 yes because the, situation you know, would gradually change yes sir. situation would surely improve yes sir yes. thanks a lot sir okay okay